Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Kermanda for Yoga You Online, and I'm here today with yoga therapist and educator Chris Cub. Chris has a master's degree in physical therapy and kinesiology from the University of Southern California, and she's also an ACE certified personal trainer. She's a frequent presenter of programs for both IAYT and Yoga Alliance. And she brings to her extensive experience as a yoga teacher, 25 years of clinical experience working as an integrative physical therapist. She uh, has specialized in neurological and pediatric rehabilitation. And she also has her own integrative PT practice called Fit Yoga Therapy. So Chris, I'm super happy to welcome you back. Thank you. you. Are, of course, rec um, a, a, a beloved figure in our Yoga U uh, community because you've presented for us in the past. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually gonna ask you about one of those things. So the American College of Sports Medicine calls flexibility one of the five major components of fitness. In the yoga world, that constantly gets conflated with stretching and specifically static stretching. So you've presented courses for us in the past where you've dispelled the notion that the only kind of stretching is static stretching and that that's the best, also always the best kind of stretching and the notion that you can stretch your way out of any problem. <laughs> so what I'd like you to take on today is that notion of what comprises flexibility. So when we're talking about flexibility, we're talking about um, soft tissue in the body. And when we're talking about soft tissue in yoga, invariably that goes around to fascial system, the fascia, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that can lead us down a clinical pathway. But I think that there's a case to be made that the soft tissue network is the truly yogic system in the body because under that rubric of fascia or soft tissue, you have all of it. You have muscle, you have tendons, ligaments, joint capsules, eyeballs, you know. Um, and when you look at it in Gray's Anatomy or in a anatomy class, they're showing you, you know, the tendon stops here, and the muscle goes here. But in fact, it's all invested in each other. It's interweaving. It's constantly evolving within the structure to serve a different purpose. And what I'd like to do is just ask you to just speak on that for a moment because you have really extensive knowledge about that network. Okay. I um, Not too I, big of a question to start with. <laughs> well, I think it's just interesting, especially for yoga students and teachers to really explore how the fascial system does create that connection of everything together, um, not only physically, but in a mind-body way. Um, one of the most interesting things I have discovered about fascia through my work is how it is a communication system. So throughout the fascial system, which surrounds everything in our body, as you mentioned, um, it also has innervation and you will have a communication from the fascial system to the brain and nervous system about different types of things such as vibration, um, tension, uh, touch. Uh, one of the most important, I think, is where your body is in space. We call that proprioception. And thus, you're going to get a lot of information from this fascial system about where your body is and how your body is moving. And when we're moving into flexibility, um, as we have learned with our um, investigation into stretching being more than just lengthening a tissue, it's actually using the nervous system to change how the body responds to sensory feedback. So for example, when you stretch your hamstrings, many people are quote tight and they may feel a resistance and think, oh, my muscle is tight but it's really the nervous system communicating that, oh, you're doing something here. I'm not sure what's happening. It may be danger. So I'm gonna, the nervous system says, I'm gonna communicate back to the muscle and the soft tissue to protect. 
Um, so when we learn how to tap into that communication system and I don't want to say manipulate, but um, access that power by using our breath, which will slow down that fight or flight response or freeze response and using our awareness to uh, even just talk to ourselves in terms of letting ourselves know what we're doing is non-harming, that we're actually facilitating more healthy movement, then that reaction of fight or flight becomes less and even maybe goes away. And then you're able to access being able to create more ease of movement in any area of your body that you may have a restriction. And this especially is true when you've had an injury, because when you've had an injury, your body has most likely put down um, scar tissue and in the fascial system, that'll be put down more uh, disorganized. So your body's even more like hypervigilant about protecting that area. So how can we access that area on more than just a physical level? And that's where the yoga comes in because of our tools of breath, awareness, and um, mind-body connection, shifting our perspective and our perception of what is happening from something that is harmful, which the way we're doing it is not harmful intentionally to something that is helpful and healthy for us. And that really changes the whole dynamic of movement when you have that power to change your perception of what's happening. You've really expanded the concept also of flexibility of being more than I'm bending over really far. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like... <laughs> Uh, it's a three-dimensional and it's all systems kind of a phenomenon to become more quote unquote flexible. Is that, is that an accurate reading? Yes. I mean, flexibility is more than just having a length of a muscle or soft tissue. It's being able to move with ease through your full capacity of range of movement. And everybody's different. Everybody has different limitations from genetics from um, just how they grew up, what sports they were in, you're predisposed to certain more ease and mobility. Just right now the Olympics are going on, which is a great, wonderful way to really look at it. You look at the different athletes, look at a um, ski jumper compared to a mogul um, mm -hmm. athlete. Their bodies are completely different and their capacities are different based on how they've trained. So flexibility for one person who maybe does moguls would be a whole nother, nother um, focus. And probably those athletes who are more flexible in certain areas will gra uh, gravitate towards, towards certain sports. And we see that in yoga all the time because a lot of people who go to yoga are people who already move with ease through big ranges of motion. And the people mm -hmm. who don't come are the people who are like, I can't do that because I'm tight. Um, so we attract those who are already able to move when actually it would be really, really nice if people who had less mobility were more um, felt more welcome or felt like that they were be successful in a yoga practice because they're the ones who might need it. So yeah. how would tapping into the fascial to the nature of the fascial, what I call that whole kind of evolving system, how would tapping into that? allow someone who's less flex, who's not a yogi or who's mm -hmm. a yogi who considers themselves very stiff. You hear people say this all the time, I can't touch my toes. Um, to which I would say, are you trying to pick something up? <laughs> 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 what if you bend your knees? Could you, did you put your own socks on? But I digress. Um, but, but what about creating more of that flexibility by learning, what could we learn about the fascial network? You mentioned it as a system of, of kind of um, communication. Mm -hmm. It's also hydration, right? It's also storing emotions. It's also what energy, what else is going on in that fascial structure? And what, how could we uh, parlay that into more flexibility if you wanna use that? Yeah. And I always like to say ease of movement first, because mm -hmm. our, 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 um, our mind's perception of flexibility has been so conditioned to mean stretchy. So <laughs> ease of movement in the um, fascial system, because 
you have certain areas that maybe have stored more emotional tension. And a lot of times we talk about our um, stress being stored in our low back or even your jaw or certain parts of our body, your shoulders, Mm -hmm. where that is a place that your body tends to store tension. And the fascial system will read that tension. And when it feels tension, it actually tells the muscles to contract a little bit more. And so we can, by accessing, again, kind of integrating the emotional part of yoga, where we're talking about letting go of stress, letting go of anxiety, becoming aware of where and how we feel these emotions in our body to help access letting that dissipate so it's not restricting our movement or causing us to feel tension Mm -hmm. can be um, powerful. And the stored energy athletically is uh, so important because the fascial system helps create more strength and power in the body because it stores kinetic energy. And if we were just to depend on our low back muscles to help us with big movements, picking up something heavy, especially like a power lifter or someone who's doing something Mm -hmm. with a lot of power, we wouldn't be successful. So that fascial system is a, is a kind of like a spring that assists the muscles to move. So in those ways, it can definitely be an asset. Is there a connection uh, then to a stored or accumulated inflammation in the body that, that the fascia plays a big role in or is are they are those related so 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 you mentioned soreness and tightness and everything but mm-hmm. what about disease process like arthritis is that uh what's that relationship with the fascial network to disease systems of inflammation well if you think about inflammation a lot of times it really is a uh, inflammation is not always a bad thing what what's bad about inflammation is when it becomes stagnant or too much. So inflammation is our body's natural way to address certain things in our body, you know, an injury or disease process. But what happens is it can get stuck and then the inflammation gets too great. And the fascial system being all encompassing encompasses the skin and the lymph nodes and all those systems, the circulatory system, which help bring the inflammation out as well as in. And so if we're helping to, kind of make that system more fluid, the fascial system more fluid, it's going to have less compression and less restriction on those systems that help get the inflammation out and moving. Um, So if we think about the the tools that we use for fascial um, release, which is also becoming a controversial word, what are we releasing? But fascial um, manipulation or however you might want to look at it, we're accessing, you know, foam rolling or massage therapy balls, or even our own hands if we're doing it self myofascial release to help create more fluidity of mm-hmm. um, movement of that system, and that will, in in accordance, also bring the inflammation to be able to come out. Because mm-hmm. the inflammation comes in, but then it gets stuck, and it's hard for it to get out. So we spend a lot of our time trying to get the inflammation to flow. It's Mm -hmm. again, back to a reciprocal flow. We don't want no inflammation because if inflammation is a healing process, but we want to make sure it doesn't get too much and get stuck and cause compression, restriction, pain, and dysfunction that way. So you mentioned circulation and you mentioned um, something else that made me think of hydration. Mm-hmm. and moisture and doesn't an understanding like a better understanding of the fascial network doesn't that change the idea that those are also separate that the the moisture systems in the body yeah I mean, are, I, are very tied into the fascial network is that a fair statement yeah definitely i mean uh, one of the things i talk about in the course is how when our fascial system gets dehydrated it's almost like a dried up sponge or a dried up dish towel. And no matter how much we stretch or move the sponge, if it's not hydrated, it can't expand and move and have ease of manipulation or movement. Um, So the hydration helps to create that um, environment for the fascia to be healthy. And the um, water molecules actually bind to the collagen fibers. And if you don't have enough hydration, then it's difficult to make that movement happen. 
So anytime we have dehydration, if you have a trigger point or a soreness, many times the first question I'll ask a client is, have you been drinking enough water? Are you, mm-hmm. are you hydrated? People have cramps. Are you hydrated? It's like sleep, hydration, diet. There's just like the base things. Like if you don't have those, everything else is going to suffer for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you mentioned myofascial release. And I know that, that there's a lot of um, emerging research, or maybe it's old research, and I'm just <laughs> getting, getting clued <laughs> into it now, but that it is I've been on this static stretching isn't the answer to everything kick for a while now, but I'm starting to see things that say that there's a relationship or, or the, the comparison of static stretching or any kind of stretching versus some of the techniques you're talking about foam release that, that the outcome can be better with some of that manipulation of the tissue. Is that, um, something you're looking at? Yeah, there were a couple of studies I was just looking at right now that looked at comparing static stretching to foam rolling. And uh, there was one study that looked at static stretching alone versus foam rolling alone and then performance afterwards. And they were similar. So similar effects to taking doing a static stretch and then doing a workout and then doing foam rolling and doing a workout. What they found about static stretching, which is a negative, is that it can decrease your performance. It's a small, teeny little percentage, and perhaps that's not much importance to the normal person. But if you're an elite athlete and you have a 2% decrease in performance, that's a big deal. So if you would know that, hey, I could either static stretch before I worked out or I could do some foam rolling and get the same results, why wouldn't I do foam rolling? Because... Mm -hmm less chance of it affecting my performance and decreasing my muscular output. So that was kind of interesting to see those two compared. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, static stretching is more effective when we're already warmed up and when our body is more ready and that takes longer. So again, looking at efficiency, just of what's more efficient time-wise, you know, so that might be another consideration for someone. So can a yoga uh, practitioner or a yoga teacher introduce some of these uh, rolling or myofascial release? You mentioned you can do with your hands, but um, is that a good thing to bring into the yoga studio? Some either props or techniques to do some myofascial release? And would you do it at the beginning of your practice or intersperse? So that's something that's like been my... um mantra for the last 15 years i started doing that a while ago and it's just is really powerful and it's easy to do Uh, so what um, you can do is have foam rollers available ask people to bring in foam rollers or tennis balls if you want to make it low maintenance tennis balls work well Mm -hmm. or massage therapy balls and basically just integrate it into your practice so you wouldn't have to foam roll the whole body And then do your practice because that would be boring and probably, you know, no one would really want to do that. But what you can do is is as you are moving, you start out with unwinding, which we talk about in the course where you're doing more intuitive movement, letting the body guide you. Uh, The mind doesn't really look at structural movement. You're just kind of moving with your body. It's very intuitive. And then Mm -hmm. that's kind of like warming the body up almost like a sun salutation. And you use similar movements to follow the anatomy train lines of the body to unwind tension. So again, going back to that proprioceptive sensory thing, like when you first get up in the morning, most of us, unless you're like 20 or younger, are a little stiff in the morning. And then after we move a little bit, we feel better. It's not that we got tight overnight. We just were in one position, maybe in the body needed to move. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of the intention. And then what you can do is literally just sequence your class to where as you're moving into poses, which require more ease of movement, say in your quadriceps, then maybe before you do that movement or that posture or that sequence of two to three postures, you would foam roll the quadriceps and then you move into the posture. So that posture feels 
better. It feels more fluid, just like when you unwind first. So it's again about creating that ease of movement. So the person with tight hamstrings before they just start class with a standing forward fold, maybe they rolled their hamstrings a little bit mm-hmm. and did some movement and then go into a standing forward fold. It just feels more, more easy. Yeah. Just, yeah. Know, just, it seems like uh, the compression would have a beneficial effect on the hydration mm-hmm. that if you rolled over a trigger point or a knot, that would also have a beneficial effect in a way that a gross yoga pose wouldn't. Correct. It's more, um, very, it's a very good point. It's, it's a little bit more, um, concentrated input to an area that might have tension. And for example, a lot of times when you roll your quadriceps, you'll find you have more tension towards the outside of the quadriceps versus the middle or the inside. And guess what's attached to the outside of the quadriceps, the IT band. Mm -hmm. And it's well known now, pretty much in most circles that we don't really need to roll our IT band. One, it's painful to do that. And two, it doesn't really have much of an effect. But if we roll the tissue right beside it, that's attached to the IT band and release that tension in that area, then the Mm -hmm. IT band starts to move more easily, has less um, discomfort. Mm Because what people really complain of, oh, it's up in my hip, it rubs or up Mm -hmm. down by my knee. So that I was just going to say that if you rolled the uh, right next to the IT bat, I I was imagining that would create more flexibility in the knee and the hip joints. Correct. Correct. Uh, Because you've got a distributed, you're just getting a better distribution of the whole muscle chain and, and fascial chain. So a lot of times before you do a lot of deep hip openers, you might roll the quads and the glutes because, you know, you roll the quads and the glute, glute max, especially is attached to that IT band. And all of a sudden your hips are going to feel more um, open and more released. So you have um, a class, (laughs) you have a class coming up for us on this very topic, yoga for myofascial release. And has it got a big name, Chris? Mm You can say it because I <laughs> you have to use big words. It's yoga for myofascial release. I'm reading it off my screen. Enhancing the pliability of the body-wide fascial network. But I think that is what, exactly what we're talking about. And I think it's a wonderful um, adjunct to a yoga practice. But can you talk a little bit about the class? Mm-hmm. Um, basically, the class is two parts. The first part, I talk a lot about what is fascia get you familiar with the makeup of it, the latest research regarding fascia, because that changes every day. It's been a really um, hot area of research in the last 15 years. And then we talk about how it communicates with the body, um, the different types of communication it has, and how it really provides that integration with the muscles and the soft tissue to create that more holistic experience when you're doing yoga. And then the second half is practical applications. Okay, how would I use a myofascial release in a practice? What areas of the body would I use it with? How would I implement it in a class? And then I have a practice that goes along with a course where you actually incorporate that. You're doing foam rolling and yoga together. So you can see how that would work and how it would feel. And you brought a variety of props into the class, right? To show how you might use a ball versus a roller versus I don't know what else you've got. Correct. Your little bag been, of <laughs> your little bag of <laughs> release tricks. Yeah, I think it's just a foam roller and massage therapy balls. So uh, and maybe a yoga strap and a, a block. So it's not too much. Um, but yeah, you can get by with not much at all and and get a really good experience. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a great a great course, and. Uh, a great resource for people who want to bring some myofascial release into their practice in a kind of, I, you know, I've seen your, um, I've, I haven't seen the course, but I've seen the practice and it's a really simple stuff. It's not mm-hmm. complicated mm-hmm. stuff. Not at Those all. Those are really easy ways to, to introduce some of these uh, techniques into a practice that would be very easy for anyone, even someone who's taking the course on their own, not a teacher. 
Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, okay. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the course and uh, thank you again for talking to us about flexibility. Thanks for being flexible. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. And we'll see you in class. Okay. Sounds good. I look forward to it.